we had to come by here and talk to Dennis Long with the Aeroprax company. And it's been, as I recall, about a year and a half since you took this over from the previous operators. And I want to ask you generally now, uh, tell me when that was and tell me generally how it's been going for you, Dennis. Okay. Well, took over in July of 2015. Sold one very quickly after that, which really is a nice start of a small business. And since then, I have delivered 10, put in an order yesterday for the 11th one. I have two in stock. One of them is probably sold when I get home as soon as he can see it. And I got two more coming off a container on Monday. So things are actually going very well. People are accepting the airplane now that it's back to where it's in main view of everybody in the public again. Tell me, get me in the ballpark for price without getting too specific about it, just to show people what the value might be. Okay. Ballpark, most common options that people like, the larger fuel tank, the mud guards, the bigger tires or wheel pants, a general good starting point is 82 to 83,000. And a fully loaded, full bore loaded one, you can get up to 105, but a really nice one with the MGL equipment, autopilot, 95-ish. Okay, so. For those people, I knew that was going to be about the numbers, and there's a lot of folks that go, these things are all 150, 180,000, and there are some at that, and there's some nice airplanes. They're no wonderful question. airplanes. I, I would say they're probably worth that number, but in any event, if you don't have that budget, I understand you can't, you can't afford that. I get that. Uh, so these numbers here are much more affordable for more people, and that's why I love that you're having some success with it, Dennis. Uh, tell me about the one now that I just hinted at, because I'm looking over your shoulder here and I'm seeing the dual control yokes, which for a lot of people is just what they want, because they learn how to fly a Cessna, Piper, you name some GA airplane. They're all like this, so that's comfortable for people, but that doesn't have to be that way. So tell me about the new one coming in. Well, it, it's actually, I've allowed people to order them however they want. The stick has always been available, uh, and I've started... Is it dual joysticks then? With the one wide on each stick? Side? We can do the Y oh. stick in, in the center, like a... Okay, so it's a center it's in stick. In the center then. stick, throttle on the left side, on the left seat, right side on the right stick. And as I let people order the history over the last year, 70% are going stick, 30% are as going yoke. Right. Okay, okay. I would have thought it would have been the other way around, that more people would go with the yoke as that was familiar to them. But Correct. you're selling to people that are comfortable with joysticks and want to stick exactly. with that. Exactly. Huh? Uh, two of my customers came out of Challenger 2s. So to them, the stick was the most natural sure. fit. Another guy was flying a CJ6 Nanchang. Perfect fit for him. So each customer can get it however they want. Actually, this has been around for quite a while. I flew it with Yuri Yakovlev, the designer, uh, 15 years ago or something in the Ukraine. It was essentially the same airplane then. It was then, essentially the same But airplane. you've made some nice little improvements, and I'm sure they have as well. Tell me a couple of them. I'm looking kind of over, over your shoulder here at that nose wheel, and I'm thinking, that doesn't look the same as I remember. So let's start there and go back. Well, they had a telescopic nose wheel like most people do with a shock or spring loaded inside, leaf spring, and then they went to a coil spring. But there's still that issue where on hard landings, if it binds, it sticks. Now it really loads up and bends. The old L model, that's all they had. When they went to the LS, as you know, in what, 2008, when 1,320 pound was finalized, they were already selling these planes very well in Australia. And they said, well, we want metal on the whole airplane. So the original ones had fabric on top of the wings, fabric on the bottom, fabric on the moving surfaces, the west all metal, other than the composite on the cowling covers. Yeah, that's a, that's a common way to make that shape up there. So but they, the older ones were, were, were fabric. On the bottom and on the top. Right. Now, these still have fabric on the bottom of the wing, but not the top. They're all okay. metal. The moving surfaces are still fabric. When they went to 1320, they boxed the whole beam underneath the bottom where the gear goes in, so it's a full box. You hear pickup talks being talked about with fully boxed beam frames and everything. They've done the same thing here. Does that mean it's a one-piece element, or is it, or the, the landing gear plugs into a box? Well, the, the box, or the main frame that goes across the airframe, is a box. Okay. And, and then the gear goes up into the gear bolt street. The mates into that. Yes. Okay, got it. So they went the heavier gear, and since the early models around the world were 1,252 pounds gross, or in some countries are still 1199, when we went 1320, they did that, beefed it up, heavier gear that's almost indestructible. Anybody can bend something. Of course, well, yeah. But they took care of the. But they're nose very durable. Gear. I mean, I'm looking at the parts here, and, and these are these are stout-looking parts with big boy tires on them, and that uh, trailing link. Now I see how that would. You're going to get flex, and you know people are going to occasionally slap the nose wheel down. Yes, you shouldn't do that, but people do it. It's, it just happens. 
or you hit a bump or something, you know, so not always into pilot's control either. That looks like that would be very durable to me. Is, it, have you found it to be so? What they have done, they've also fixed the geometry that if you land with your rotor full lock in a crosswind and you let the nose wheel down, it just pulls straight. It doesn't twist, bend, flex. It just steers the plane straight. Okay. It'll slap your foot pretty good, but it's gonna not going to twist the nose gear off. That's good. They were really going after because it's a stole operation and they build them and they're now certified in 49 different countries and there's a lot of those countries that have very unimproved places they take off and land. Yeah, I'm looking at the airplane here that I'm seeing over your shoulders and thinking, you could land this thing just about anywhere with those big tires. And, and this is a light aircraft too, lighter than some of the other ones, isn't it? Empty weight runs 700 to 720. Okay. If you loaded it with servos, autopilots, auto, and depending on the paint color, of course, paint different densities. And paint can add weight, of course. The, uh, the heaviest one I weighed in out of the 11 that I've put through the shop is 748. Okay, that was, was the heaviest one. It was loaded with everything, parachute, okay. autopilot, and servos. A typical number among many of the great LSAs we got out here, they're pushing up toward 800. So you're you're a good bit lighter or maybe significantly lighter if it's a more sparingly equipped aircraft. Correct. That, But I've got, got people that appreciate it. Leather is not available. You, you want to do custom seats, you could, but leather weighs extra weight. They've paid very good attention to keeping the weight down, but yet a robust airplane. And it's incredible what I hear stories guys have had them for 10 or 15 years even the old models some of the stories they tell that hey man I should have flipped this thing over or I should have bent stuff and we got done we roll okay excellent good to hear that all right so a lot of good stuff about the structure of the airplane there and its durability and its long-lasting all good aspects of the Aeropract A22 now tell me a little bit about the changes that I see inside this airplane on the panel and we'll have a closer look at it well this particular plane it seems like a lot of people are wanting to go glass panel but of course everybody wants to save money. So Those MGL- are in some uh, conflict, aren't they? I don't blame them at all. <laughs> MGL has a very good price point uh, around the world and they're very serviceable. And what we've come to find out is the MGL panel allows me to do a full bore panel at about half the cost of some of the other competitors okay. out there. So the, the difference between steam gauges to glass is affordable. Everybody has a different term of affordable, but it's affordable difference. And it just gives them a voice to say, hey, I'm okay with this price, but wow, I really like that. And they don't have to, I don't have to add 15,000 for them to get all the fancy features. Yeah, so, you know, a bunch of round dials, nothing wrong with those. They've served aviation for many, many decades. And 60% six, of my people are still going round dials. Is that right? And they're simple and they don't go wrong and they don't go dark and all those other things that can possibly happen. However, you just kind of can't beat that. And I see you've got an interesting combination here. You got one panel mounted, and I love the MGL line. They do some great stuff, beautiful looking screens. I think they were the very first to have touch screen too. Yes. Uh, so these guys are ahead of it, out of South Africa, but well represented here in the US and as you say, all over the world. So that's great. You got And you've got a little narrower panel too, which gives you great visibility. I love that panel, but it does constrict your space a little bit for lots and lots of big screen so you got one big screen in there that we see but then you've got another one on a swivel mount that could be an iPad yours is an Android but you could have whatever you want there and is that a combination that people are adapting because that's fairly inexpensive if you use something like uh, a level or whatever to power yes. that thing and that's becoming more popular even the steam gauge guys are all using some kind of a tablet for navigation nobody's buying dedicated Garmin units anymore the iFly 740s and by using the 10 inch glass even center mounted like this one is, there's plenty of room for eight inch tablet on the right hand side. You could put it on the left hand side, even down in this area where there's your no legs or anything yeah, but saw, your visibility. It's, it's not in your way at all over there and yet, and now you got something you can pull out of the airplane and do flight planning or watch a movie or whatever it is you want to do with that thing once you take it out. So I'm guessing that for an airplane that's trying to keep a, a low acceptable price point, that would be an advantage because those things are fairly inexpensive. Yes. And what I've also found, the one I spec'd out yesterday for the order, he put the MGL panel all the way to the left. He's going to put a 10-inch iPad on the side of it. And that, with the 10-inch panel on the iPad, Gosh, you still have a lot, yeah. But there's no room to put two 10-inch panels in this. There's yeah. just not enough space. I like it because with that tapering panel, that's how I'll refer to it, uh, you, you've got good forward angle visibility while you're landing, just for sightseeing, and yeah, you got all this glass around you, or, or plastic, but uh, you know, why not be able to see out there? Why that, have a panel block your view? And that's what they're thinking. Even on a high angle landing, when you're doing a full stall landing, full flaps, very slow, which stall speed is around 30 miles an hour, so you can come <laughs> in just barely below that if you want. 
you can still see the runway in front of you. You never lose sight of it. Um, and it's just everybody that flies the plane, fun word comes back in. They'll say it's the most fun I've ever had. They can look straight down without tilting the plane over. And it goes through bumps. Stall speeds 30 with full flaps, 40 clean. That's miles an hour. Cruise 100 to 110, depending on the wheel that configuration. miles an hour as well then? Pardon me, that's a miles an hour. Okay, all right. So 90 knots on, on cruise. You can go faster, but a good cruise at 80% power puts it right at 100 to 110. This particular plane is locked on at 100. There's a yellow one on the lot, one that I sold to a gentleman. He's at 108, 109, but he has the wheel pants. I see, okay, right. All right, let's, uh, let's kind of, you already touched on the construction of the airplane with more metal than it used to have. Of course, we can see the um, immense amount of clear glass that you can see out of. Uh, that's always been a neat feature about the airplane, really makes it stand out. Let's go up to the nose. What prop are you using and what engine are you using? Yeah, we have actually several props available. The Kiev is the standard, excellent, durable, great performance prop. It does have some small weaknesses and durability over time. Cool prop is also an approved prop for us. Uh, and now the duck swirl flash propeller just ah, came okay. on my list. And of course the warp drive is a world standard. Okay, all, all good brands and uh, see a lot of people adapting that duck. You know, those yeah. guys, they seem to be doing a nice job with it. But this is a beautiful kind of a scimitar shaped prop here. Everybody's getting perfect saying how well, how nice this one yeah, looks. Yeah, it just looks visually very pleasing. It is. Okay, what engine are you running in here, Dennis? We're available with the, this one is the 100 horse ULS. Okay. Most everybody's going to do a 100 ULS. I'm available with the 80 horse, but the price difference between that and 100 is not significant. The IS engine, I've only sold one, I'm getting inquiries, but because of the ASTM certification process around the world, when Aeroprac did the IS, they did the Dynon panel, because that's what they wanted at the time. I see, okay. So if somebody says, hey, I want the uh, IS engine, we have to have the Dynon panel. I see, okay. I know Dynon, another great company, has done a lot of good great in this equipment. industry. Uh, they've worked very closely with Rotax, and so it's all harmonized on the screen very nicely. You don't have to have some other backup gizmo to keep track of what's going on to the engine. So we may get to I doing get, the MGL sometime way. in the future, but we don't know what's going to get there. A lot of good stuff there. Um, any other particular points you want to add that's changed in the last two, three, four months? Well, not changed, but added. This photo window door is becoming really popular in flight. Oh, yeah, I see it. Okay. That's Open cool. the door, especially in hot oh, environments. Oh, yeah, that's a nice big one. Yeah, plus ventilation. I mean, why not? Especially down here. The old ultralight pilot in me loves it, you know. Get rid of the darn door, but anyway, that's a great feature. Anything that, else? That uh, de uh, defroster fans are now available. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think what else is for new the from screen, the for the windscreen you're talking about. Yeah, windscreen. Yeah, okay. Um, the stick option is something that's always been there. Um, is there is there a price difference on that, or is it just pick one or the other? They end up being about the same because okay. most people that go with stick go electric trim on your thumb. I see. Okay. Where sure. the yoke, the manual trim is the most popular. Okay. Because it's a one hand, quick pull up, pull down, instantaneously. Okay. You don't have to hit it and wait. Yep, I'm looking at it there. I guess yeah. so. So the price difference, if you total it up, is maybe only a couple hundred. Okay, almost insignificant. It's almost insignificant. All right, we've, I think we've packed a lot of information into a short interview. Dennis, tell us where we go on the web to find your U.S. operation so people can find out more or send you an order. Okay, it's, of course, www.aeropractusa.com. All right, very good. Uh, lots of stuff about the Aeropracts over the years and many other of the light sport aircraft, light kit aircraft and ultralights, all available in the affordable aviation range on bydanjohnson.com. Thanks for joining Dennis Long and myself here at Sebring. Thank you very much. The Copper State Fly-In has been bringing aviation enthusiasts in the southwest U.S. together since 1973. This year we are thrilled to be hosting the Copper State Fly-In at the Buckeye Municipal Airport, KBXK, in conjunction with the Buckeye Airfare. The dates for the Fly-In are February 8, 9 and 10, 2019. We anticipate that the 2019 Copper State Fly-In will break all of our previous attendance records. Admission and parking to the 2019 Copper State Fly-In and Buckeye Airfare are free, including the two-hour air shows, beginning at noon, Saturday and Sunday. So make sure to join us for a weekend of free fun for the entire family. See light sport aircraft, experimental aircraft, ultralights, vintage and military aircraft, as well as action-packed demonstrations. Visit the many educational forums, aircraft displays, youth activities, or one of the over 100 vendors. 
Copper State Flying Inc. is a volunteer-run, non-profit organization dedicated to promoting recreational and general aviation through events, scholarships, and public education. Proceeds from the Copper State fly and help support scholarship programs for youth seeking careers in the aerospace industry. Copper State is the largest fly-in of its type in the western United States and the fourth largest fly-in in the U.S. We look forward to seeing you, February 8-10, 2019, at the Buckeye Municipal Airport, 3000 South Palo Verde Road, Buckeye, Arizona.